Hi, welcome to the National Fireman's Journal podcast. And I'm Bobby Hall, the 10th Editor-in-Chief of Fire Engineering, and that's where that title comes from. So the National Fireman's Journal, that was the title of fire engineering originally back in 1877. So that's why we're called the National Fireman's Journal podcast. So we're firefighters, that was the name of the magazine, and uh, that's how we're gonna keep this heritage alive and keep this tradition moving forward. So on the very first show, and this is the very first show, we have our good friend and dear friend, Mike Dugan. We've been friends for far, far too long. <laughs> we, we, Mike had hair and mine was dark when we were, sort of started hanging out together. And uh, so the National Fireman's Journal, when they started the National Fireman's Journal in 1877, it was devoted to the interests of the firemen of the nation. And... I think that's an important thing to keep going, right? And the way people consume information today is via podcasts. So we're going to be doing this podcast with Mike and, and other folks down the road as we go through this deal. We've got uh, Graham Pleshy and Jeff Burgess lined up. We've got Kenny Fent. We've got uh, Gavin Horn. We've got all kinds of great people who are going to come and talk to us. We're talking with the guy, uh, Danny Sheridan, Ray McCormick, a bunch of guys out of that job we've got uh, we've reached out to Mike DeBron um, a couple of other people out there on the west coast so stay tuned we're going to do them you know kind of sporadically we'll throw them up on fire engineering and we'll put them up on our youtube channel but it's the national fireman's journal podcast so devoted to the interests of the firefighters of the nation and we're going to kind of stay american because well we're americans and uh, that's what we know so we may have a European guest on from time to time, or you know, a foreign guest on from time to time. But it's gotta be an American show about American firefighting and 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 what we know and what we don't know. So that's the gist of it. So Mike, thank you for agreeing to sit in with me on this very first one. And uh, we're gonna see where this goes. Uh, a little bit about my good friend, Mike. He uh, was with the FDNY for over 30 years, about 35 years, Mike? No, 27. 27, sorry, buddy, 27. Uh, got one of the few people in the FDNY to win the Archer Medal, which is the award for bravery. He also won the Gordon Bennett, and then they do the Archer every three years. The Archer is given to that firefighter whose actions, whose bravery was so outstanding that they wanted to recognize him as the bravest of the brave for the last three years. And Mike won that award for an incredible rescue, uh, rope rescue that he did with the assistance of firefighter John McCain uh, years ago. So we can talk about that as we go down the road, you know, rope rescue and all of that. I mean, the FDNY history is, is just rich. Well, we'll go to, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll dovetail into that right away with, uh, with uh, rope issues. I mean, there's the, uh, um, I remember Ernie D. Maria years ago working on the project for rope. And then of course, after Black Sunday, there's another resurgence of personal rope. Um, we always talk to firefighters about having personal rope, right? And Mike, you, uh, you, you effectively did that in 1995. We got the year right, right? It was December 95? It was December 91. December 91. Yep. December 91, you know, Mike successfully deployed rope with firefighter John McCain uh, off, the, off of a five-story building and was able to rescue young Pablo Martinez, if I've got the story right. Yep. He was 20 at the time. So uh, Pablo, who's uh, uh, 50 now, right? Yeah, close to 50, is 50 because Mike was willing to do a rope rescue. So um, we often think of rope for us, but obviously Mike was carrying it at the time for Pablo. Yeah, and I mean, the rope thing is uh, the roof man in the New York City Fire Department brings the rope to the roof. It's for us if a brother gets in trouble because I worked with a great fireman Jimmy Sears, who rescued a captain when I first got to Ladder 43, he rescued a captain, I think, in 85 out of the top floor window. Captain was cut off. And the ropes, we can go back to the Frisbee Fitzpatrick where the ropes failed. And, you know, the whole thing with the ropes is they have to be maintained, they have to be inspected, and you have to be familiar with them. You have to drill on these. Every Monday we had a drill on the ropes. It was something we did. It was part of how the companies I worked in ran. 
every Monday, we repacked the rope so it didn't develop a memory. We took it out. We practiced sonats. We practiced all of the things that involved in it. So it became second nature. It was like muscle memory. And being a member of a good company or a good fire department, you do those things. You practice those things. They're not done often, but when they're done, you need to know exactly what you're doing. And it can't be your first time tying those knots and things like that. Yeah, I mean, well, when you went off on the on the rescue in '91, and sorry, I'm adjusting my mic here, so we're gonna learn some. We're gonna be learning crap as we do these, so bear with us. Um, we're gonna we're gonna figure this out as we go through it all. But uh, so when you rescued Pablo, um, that was you and McCain, and and there was not an anchor point that was really substantial. So you improvised with a hook. Um, you're not going to think of that kind of stuff on the fly unless you've thought of it in advance, right? How do I set up an anchor point that's not, uh, you know, an air conditioning unit or, or a rated anchor? And oftentimes to affect a real rescue, that's what you're dealing with. Something that's, you know, real and, and everything that goes along with that. So, yeah. And I think for personal use, I guess it's a good question for the, you know, when we're talking with folks out there, you know, we always think about having rope for us, but, you know, kind of rope for them, right? I mean, duh, right? And yeah. uh, I think that's a great, great thing to hammer forward. And I, I wonder how many folks, I wonder how many folks are out there doing rope drills, um, you know, uh, monthly. Yeah, I, I wonder. I don't know. I don't know. But if you are carrying, listen, the number one thing to me is, you know, if you get yourself jammed up, having a rope that you can get yourself out. We had the personal harnesses that they took away before the Black Sunday fire, and now all the guys carry the ropes. you got to know how to use these things. If you're going to be going up, you have to know how to get yourself out. The New York City Fire Department just had a fire a couple of weeks ago down in Chinatown, and four members slid off the roof onto a fire escape, but they were cut off on the roof. They couldn't get back to their primary means of egress. And they used the rope to get them down to an area of refuge where they could get into a, get to a ladder and get themselves off the roof, off the roof. Okay. You've got to know what your job is and know these tools. If you're going to be going up on a roof, you got to know how to use the roof rope. If you're going to be uh, going inside a burning building, above maybe the second floor. You know, if you're the third floor above, you have to know how to get yourself out. Uh, Valentine's Day, we had the brothers, brothers then, the, the firefighters, the three from uh, Reisland Street in, um, in Pittsburgh. That was, I think, their 25th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, um, where that happened. And again, very important that we understand where we are putting ourselves and we are trained to that level. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the rope, although we're talking about rescue rope here, it, it can serve multi-purpose and multi-functions. I mean, obviously, you can raise and lower equipment with it. You can use it for search if you need to. Um, there's a myriad of things you can do with rope. And even, even in, in terms of down firefighter, you can improvise a quick harness, you know, with, with your rope and get a lot of leverage in order to do that. So part of your rope drill, although, you know, you want to be doing tying it off and creating a, you know, a, a good uh, connection for yourself, a lot of the you know, other things you can do with rope in that moment with your hands gloved, wearing your equipment, you know, and going through that. Now, obviously, I think during drill, there's a time and place to be doing it without, you know, all your stuff on, but we need to practice in the conditions that we're go going to be forced to do this in because if you're in the middle of a fire, you take your gloves off, you're screwed. You know, you, or right. you could easily be screwed. And, yep. and, and you don't want to risk that. And you don't want to risk learning how to tie off with gloves under pressure the first time when it matters. So, you know, important stuff to remember when we're doing drill, you know, about training, right? Uh, you know, you build people up, right? You build them up, let them train, you know, in comfortable clothes, bare hands, put the gear on, put the gloves on and keep going through it, you know, until, until you, you, know, you feel like, okay, I got this, you know, and um, working with your gloves is radically different than working with your bare hands, you know? Absolutely. 
So it's a, it's a fascinating deal. And then, so the, the interesting thing comes with our bailout systems about using them for alternative, you know, purposes, um, you know, and then replacing that rope, you know, and, and maintaining that rope because, you know, if you're going to, if you haul some equipment up, uh, you know, using your, your bailout rope, you know, that rope's, you may not be serviceable at that point. You know, you gotta, you gotta be constantly aware of that. And I think the, uh, the cleaning of rope and the storage of rope is something that's really, you know, well worth talking about and, and well worth, you know, looking into. And, and I, I think that it's a, I don't care where you work either. You know, you could be doing, you could be out in the middle of, uh, you know, rural Oklahoma, rural, rural Nebraska, anywhere. And you got a grain bin, better have some rope. You know, you'd be in a barn rescue, better have some rope. You know what I mean? It, just because you don't have high rises and you don't have multi-story buildings doesn't mean you don't have to be proficient with rope. And, uh, and I'll, full disclosure, I sucked with knots. <laughs> My whole career, I sucked with knots. Uh, you know, it was always the bane of my existence. But, you know, I could do the basic ones. I could do the ones I needed to be able to do, the bowling and the clove hitch. And, the, you know, I could tie myself off. But, the, the, you know, some of the guys that I, like you, you know what I mean? Uh, and I've seen Mike with rope. You know, you, you feel like you're watching Will Rogers with a lasso. You're like, how the hell do you do that crap? What is that? You know, and you're like, then he breaks it down. Well, this is a, I'm like, get out of here. But, you know, so you're going to have, you're going to have guys and gals in your team that may not be the best, you know, rope person, but make sure they can do the fundamental, you know. And the other thing as a leader, Bobby, and I know you are a great leader. The other thing as a leader is, listen, I'm not that great with rope in all honesty, but I had great people around me and I empowered them to teach all of the members of the company the stuff they knew because they were so much better than I was with ropes. And you have men and women coming up there. You have guys who have been in the service. You have guys who have been in the tree. I, have a, I had a kid who was in the tree works. I had a kid whose father was in Rescue One. I used to joke he didn't grow up with a pacifier. He had a monkey's fist. And all of these people know their stuff. If you want to learn your stuff, you go to the best person on your crew who knows that the best and get them to be the, the teacher, the leader. And they will empower everyone else to get better on your crew. And that's how a good leader works. And that's part of what we have to do. You know, if you think, well, I'm the captain and I'm going to have to be the best at everything. You can't, you're never going to be that. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You're empowering your men and women for their strengths and weaknesses. And if we understand that, it's always better for all of us. Hey, you know, you mentioned trees a second ago and, and it, it, I got a really uh, interesting story. So I got contacted by a, a young guy who wanted to do a tree rescue class at FDIC. And, and we may do it next year. We're, we're really looking hard at it. It's a, I think it's a great idea. And what was amazing about it was we get the proposal and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, tree rescue. Okay, you know, I've seen one or two. The, the week after I got that proposal, Larry McCormick pulls off that really awesome rescue. I think he's squad two Chicago. Um, they, they do that. And I apologize to my Chicago friends if I got the squad wrong. But they pull off an awesome rescue of a guy stuck in a tree in Chicago, all about rope. I mean, you all about rope and, and Larry, obviously a world-class firefighter. We, you know, everybody alive today, anybody in the fire service today doesn't know who Larry McCormick is in Chicago, Google him. Um, great, great firefighter, great guy. Um, I remember when Larry won uh, the Courage and Valor Award, he uh, bought out, uh, what was it the Clada? I, yeah, I think it was. He threw the check down at the Clada and said, let me know when it runs out, right? And uh, all, all the guys and, and gals from Chicago came up and uh, it was a great time. Um, you know, there's the beer flowed like water and the sandwiches threw across the counter. And uh, that's the kind of guy he is, right? It was, you know, it was his day, but it was Chicago's day in his mind. And, uh, but there's, a, there's another thing to think about with rope, right? You, oh, we don't need rope here. And then we are, we're never going to do a rope. Uh, you got trees? You know, uh, unless you're Phoenix, uh, I wouldn't do a rope rescue in a, in a saguaro cactus. Could be a <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, 
every place has trees, more or less, and towers. You know, if you're gonna do tower rescue, gotta understand rope. So kind of, turn, kind of turned into a conversation on rope and then that's okay. That's what the National Fireman's Journal is about. We're, we're, we wanna talk about the things that are interesting to us. They might not be interesting to anybody else in the whole bloody freaking world, and I don't care. I really don't care about anybody except firemen um, and, and firefighters. I, I don't care. And, and if you got a hard time with the word fireman, then go to another show. You know, that, that's fine, because we're not gonna stop using it. It's a fine word. It could be firemen, firewomen, firefighters. Our profession is firefighting. I don't care. It, one of the people who want to freaking tyrannize language and control language are really bad people, right? Language is what language is. Get over it. We're not excluding anybody. We're not trying to be elitist or, or misogynistic or any of that horse hockey. It's just a word. And, and so get over yourself. Um, and that's how I feel about it. I think that I think this uh, compulsory speech thing is really bloody dangerous. And be careful about those people who are talking about, oh, we're preaching tolerance by being intolerant about someone else's language. That doesn't really add up. No, they're preaching intolerance. They're preaching tyranny. So get over it. Anyway, a little segue there. Mike, sorry to typical halt and <laughs> <laughs> rant there. Oh, God. A little pontification from Bob. Hey! Just, just to keep everything on the straight and narrow. Oh, God, I can't help myself sometimes. I don't know what, but they pay me. You know, so it's funny, right? Somewhere out there is some young firefighter just got on the job. And I remember when my buddy, Billy Goldfeder, our buddy, Billy Goldfeder, made that poster. His kid was, uh, his kid was just new to the job, Brian. And uh, Billy put out that poster, shut up and train, right? And, and I, didn't, I, I hate the word shut up, right? Ask all the questions you need to ask. There's no stupid questions. Ask all the, I will ask the stupid questions. Ask all the questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you should try to find out. But I don't think there's any bad questions. So, so that bothered me a little bit. But Billy's point was, was spot on. Train and train and train and train and train. And ask the questions, you know. Ask questions and train. That would be my poster. Billy called it Shut Up and Train. But it was a, it's a great poster. And, uh, um, and God bless him for doing it. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's just an icon and a sweet guy. And I love having him around. And uh, so I should say to everybody out there listening, this is kind of important that uh, this Thursday at FDIC, or Thursday at FDIC, coming up for, two, for 2020, um, we, we got this guy, uh, I, I, think his, I think they're gonna let him out of the home long enough to be there. Uh, <laughs> I asked his wife if we could get a pass from the home, um, but Mike is, Mike is gonna get the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. So congratulations, my friend, well-deserved. Um, Thank you very much. I'm honored and humbled. Now, I'll tell you, it, it, it's interesting. You know, lots of times people want lifetime achievement award. That well, has he written a book? And how is his book? So Mike has published hundreds of articles. Um, I, we constantly rely on him in engineering as a technical editor, um, whether it's doing podcasts, hangouts, classroom stuff. Mike has taught around the world. He's still teaching. Mike uh, does a great deal of work now. Um, in New York City with um, the um, uh, facilities there, the uh, hotels, uh, places like that. And uh, Mike is just clobbering it with the company he works for out there. And so, um, you know, we looked at it, and we're, when we're looking for that lifetime achievement person, we're always looking for somebody who's really well-rounded, right? Um, there's lots of guys that write books that have been to a fire, and, and, and Mike's been to several. So, um, we thought, you know, Mike had the right combination of street cred and training and, um, and the qualities. The other side to Mike, and I'll brag on my buddy for a minute here, is the way he's lived his life. Um, no apologies, um, no, uh, no regrets. He's always been an honest man. He's always been a just man. He's always been a fair man. And he's always been a kind man. And he's always uh, put... Others perform self, you know, um, with, with, within reason. He's always brought great honor and, and prestige to the job. And he's always lifted other people up. And, and that's really important. He's never been a bully. 
He's never been, you know, one of these people making fun of somebody for, for their benefit, which I just think is shameful. Um, he's always been somebody who uh, you, know, you could count on and, and you could trust. And I think when you put somebody up for lifetime achievement, it should be somebody that you look at and say, I'd be really happy if my kid grew up to be like that guy. You know, and, and if not, they probably shouldn't get lifetime achievement. And when you look at the, the guys and gals that we've given it to, you know, uh, Billy, Mike, Johnny Norman, Leo Stapleton, you know, uh, Jack Murphy, you know, you, you, you're in great company, you know, Tommy Brennan. Um, I mean, you just, uh, you'd be hard pressed to be in better company. And, and so congratulations. And uh, I look forward to seeing you and Missy and the girls. That ought to be awesome. See yep. the, whole, the whole Dugan clan down there in the front row. Yep. That'll, yep. that'll be, uh, that'll be just awesome. So let's get back to the, to the job and, and what's going on in the job. Anything, anything you want to talk about that you see breaking in the news or uh, anything like that? Well, I think the thing, and I've said this a lot, the job is becoming more of a job lately where people aren't driven by the duty, by the service, or we're losing some of our uh, servant leadership where we're there for the people. We are there to help people. We are there. It's probably one of the worst nights of their life, the worst day of their life. They're calling us. And we are there to serve. We are there to make a difference in people's lives. We can't always do what the best. You know, we try the best we can, and we do the best we can, and we give everybody uh, all we can. We give 110% every time. And I think we're kind of um, losing our servant creed. And it's becoming more of a job, not a calling, not a duty. And I think uh, that is, I think that's sad. I truly think it's sad that we're losing that part of our service. Hmm. Hmm. You know, uh, I think there's the ebb and flow, right? And, and I think sometimes it's just the, you know, the stuff we're bumping into, right? Um, because I go a lot of places. I, I got to tell you, I, I was just up in Simsbury, Connecticut, right? Um, neat little town. They got three houses, all volunteer, 100% volunteer. And man, that place was just like bubbling over. You know, they had guys and, and gals getting up, getting awards for running, you know, 6,000 calls. And, 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 you know, not, not for the year, but over the course of the, you know, like the 10 year award. And they would say, okay, we got, you know, Tommy coming up and, or, or Jill coming up and, and Jill over the last five years has run, you know, 6,000 calls or 7,000 calls. That's a volunteer firefighter. That's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. And, and, and then, and, and some people have like 12,000 and 14,000 and just insane numbers. And, uh, and, and they were all, everyone, everyone there was just amazing. And the house was amazing. And the, they even, these cats, these cats have their own radio station. The Simsbury Fire Department has its own radio station and they're playing, you know, the top 40 and they're playing uh, country music and they're doing PSAs. It was really, it was hip. It was really cool. And I said, that's like, the, I never saw that before. Right. Um, I've never heard of that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm telling you. So I think it's the ebb and flow. Right. And then, and then occasionally, you know, you and I do a lot of road work and we're out there doing, a, a, you know, we'll, we'll roll into some place and we'll be like, you guys do know you're a fire department, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we get kind of that like, where the hell am I kind of feeling? But then next week we bump into somebody else, right? And, and, and we're right back into, wow, you know? Yeah, and I agree with you with the ebb and flow of the fire service and the changing culture. I mean, our world has changed from you and I growing up. I mean, Social media was a newspaper. You know, um, we read magazines. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you the number of people I know that don't know what a newspaper looks like, have never picked up a newspaper. Um, you know, uh, books. You and I are voracious readers. We love to read. 
Uh, people now listen to books on tape and they get their information off of podcasts and it's a different world. And I understand that. And I think there are good to both of them, but we can't throw the old away and lose the old. And some people have to look at that and say, wow, you know, we have to kind of, we have to come to a balance. The, as I like to say all the time, the wisdom of Solomon. I wish I had it. I don't. But where that balance lies, where that balance lies. Yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there's a, yeah, the world's different. I mean, it's different than it was yesterday. And, and I think that's a good thing. I think that people forget that the quality of life in, in the world today is unprecedented. unprecedented. People are not starving today. I mean, there's some places where food is limited, but we don't have, we don't have the kinds of starvations that we used to have. But there's always those people, those apocalyptic type, you know, folks who, you know, the end of the world is coming. And, and, and that's just not the truth. Uh, we're constantly innovating. It's constantly getting better. And I think the same thing holds for the fire service. Um, you know, obviously with social media, we're finding our way uh, with it right now. I think there's, uh, there's obviously, there's always unintended consequences. And, and, and everything has a duality, right? Um, a dichotomy, if you will. So. Social media can connect us right away. There's a fire happening in New York. There's a fire happening in Bangor, Maine. There's a fire happening in Miami Dade. There's a fire happening in, you know, uh, Contra, Contra Costa, California. And, and right away, we're like right there. You know, somebody's got their cell phone and we're digging it. They're showing us some good stuff. And we're going, whoo, that's interesting. Or wow, look at how they got that set up, right? And then at the same time, there's guys, you know, saying horrible, nasty things about uh, other firefighters, and, which is just, just tears my heart out. I don't get it. But, but, I, but that's a new kind of humor. And I guess that, you know, it's edgy or whatever it is. I, I think it's harmful. I think it hurts people. I think anything that hurts people is not a good thing. You know what I mean? It intentionally hurts them. You know, uh, so, so the social media has two sides and consumption habits are changing, right? We're probably, probably in the history of the world, the world has never been more literate, but more ignorant at the same time. You know, very few people read Frost anymore or Locke or the Stoics. They might belong to some website that gives you the Stoic quote of the day and, and they post it to their Twitter feed as if they understand it. And, you know, I, 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 the more I read the Stoics, the less I understand them. Pretty much with life in general, the older I get, the more confused I've become. And, and, and I don't mean conf well, probably confused in the way most people understand it, but also less certain than I was. I think there's a, an age that we all go through in life where we're dead certain of everything. We, we, we've got it hardwired. And, and then as we get a little bit older, we're like, yeah, not so much. You know what I mean? And, um, so, and I think that's okay. I mean, and I'm not saying I've gotten to the point where I know squat about squat, but I am at the point where I can tell you that I don't know squat about squat and, <laughs> and I'm willing to say it. Right. So, I think that there's, there's a, and I've been a flow and I think that the whole social media thing, you know, we could do a whole, a whole, you know, hour on social media. I think firefighters should use it, but I think they should use it for good. Like we use everything else for good. You know, we use water for good. We use ladders for good. We use, um, you know, even for good. For good. We should use it for good, you know, and, and uh, I, I think it, you know, everybody used to be blogging years ago. Nobody's blogging anymore. A couple of guys might post a column now and then, but the whole blogging thing has kind of gone away. And, and, and then, you know, and it's just like Twitter. You know, you'll see a guy or a gal, you know, they're posting 20 things a day. And then eventually they're down to five and then maybe two and, and then maybe two or three a week. I mean, but but the, the thrill of having people respond to us makes us want to do more. And, and that's okay. Totally normal. And, and, and we all do it. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. And it's fine. But I think we're, we're going to find it. We're going to find the way to make it work. And I think the fire service is going to find a way to make it work for, for not just us, but the folks that we serve. And I think that's a great point. And I think the other thing about that is you have to know what you're talking about, about that picture, that video that you saw, what's going on there. There are people who make comments without even knowing, you know, was the, there's no engine there. What happened? 
you know, well, the first engine was out on an EMS run. The second engine was out of service for the day. So now they're waiting, but there are reports of people trapped. So the truck's going to take the door. Okay. So understand that you have to ask the proper questions about what you're seeing there to get the parameters that the brothers and sisters at that fire went through. I mean, I saw a guy one time, and I, screwed up. I saw a guy stick his head in a window and I'm like, what the hell is that guy thinking? And then I heard there was a fireman missing. So there was fire coming out the window. He stuck his head in and reached down just to see if there was anything under that window. So I would have done the same exact move. Okay. You have to know what you're talking about before, before you make these comments. Because if there's a reason for somebody to do that, would you have done the same thing? And, and be careful about the whole virtue signaling thing too, right? Like, why aren't they wearing a mask? Or here's my favorite. We did a, we did a post of the GEMS editorial board at, at a meeting. And, and like eight or nine guys showed up. And, and a couple of gals had been invited, but they couldn't make it. So these social justice warriors started hitting us the, the, the feed, the Twitter feed with, where are the people of color and where are the women and, you know, way to go. It's two, it's 20, it's 2019. And I'm like, wait a minute, these guys earned the right to be there. And the gals that aren't there couldn't be there for whatever reason. So you don't even know the whole story. And, 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 and if you're saying that we should put people into a photograph just so that it's more socially acceptable, you're an idiot. You're a complete idiot. That's called pandering. That's called tokenism, and there's nothing more insulting. The, the, the people, uh, I'm, I'm with Dr. King. Dr. King in his speech said, I've got four young girls, his daughters, and I hope that someday that they're judged only on the content of their character and not on the color of their skin. And I think if he's alive today, he would have added, or their gender, you know? And that's not to say that you should be exclusive. You should always be inclusive. But if you, if you think that people should be somewhere in order to have it, the optics right, you're an idiot. Not in this profession. Maybe if you're doing a nonprofit for, you know, uh, I don't know, diaper service delivery companies, whatever the hell that you're doing, you know, taking care of the you know, wayward gypsies, good for you. Then you can have a, a, a you know, you, you can pick one from column A, one from column B, one from column C, so that it looks like you've got, you know, quote unquote diversity. But, you know, when it comes to being in the fire service, law enforcement, EMS, it's about merit. You better know your stuff and, and you, better, you better have worked hard for a long time to sit on a board of any of our organizations, whether it's CFSI, whether it's the NFPA, whether it's the IAFF or the IAFC or, or wherever. You don't, you're not given that by virtue of your, the fact that you're a white male or, or, a, or a black woman or a gay person or anything else. It, it's just, that's wrong. That's the, that's the soft bigotry of low expectations. And it's really dangerous. And, and, and so far, I think the fire service gets that. Although the one place where I'm seeing it happen, which is interesting because it's the, it, it's just like when uh, the civilians try to run war fighting. When, when we see our mayors and our city councils um, dictating to uh, the, our agencies and our recruiters that we want you to hire this type of person with these immutable characteristics, whether it's skin or gender, to be our next you know, chief or deputy chief, that's wrong. You know, it was interesting. A, a, a fellow, I'll tell you who it was, was President Obama the other day said, women make the best leaders. Well, apparently he didn't think that when he ran against Hillary 12 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I don't know where that's coming from, Barry, but good on you. So, you know, and, and, and God bless you. Good dude, great president. I, I, got, I got no truck with the guy. But just because it's convenient to say it now, dude, doesn't make it true. And it's not true. Think of a Bloody Mary in, in England. She was the leader. Didn't work out too well for a couple hundred thousand, not hundred thousand, but a couple thousand people that got killed because they weren't Catholic, for God's sakes. So, you know, you, you, you have great leaders that are women. You have crappy leaders that are women. You have great leaders that are men. You have crappy leaders that are men. It doesn't 
that your immutable characteristics have nothing to do with your abilities, you know, for God's sakes. So anyway, I, I, I think that that, I think the fire service has got pretty much got our heads wrapped around that. And I'm writing an editorial on it right now. So it's kind of in my head, but um, it's kind of an interesting conversation to have, you know, and, and I think that the fire service in terms of inclusivity it has just done wonderful things. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the proliferation of, of just the, everything under the sun. When you, when you look at the troops, there's Chinese, there's Japanese, there's black, there's white, there's women, there's, there's every sexual orientation. And it doesn't matter for us because every day, the young people would say, we go down range. Our generation would say, we're, we go down, we're under the shadow, the shadow of death every day, because I don't care where you're working, you go on a call and, 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 and then that's it. It's game over. And, you know, and all you have is the person next to you and, and the people you're going to, they represent every gender, every race, every attitude, every political party in the world. And so you, you damn well better not have a problem with that because if you do, you don't belong. You just flat out don't belong. I've always said, I can't tell what you are or really who you are in a smoky hallway. All I know that you're my brother or my sister. You're with me. You're a fellow firefighter. You're crawling down the hallway with me. You are with me. We are a team. It does not matter. I couldn't care less about anybody's orientation, anybody's religion, anybody's skin color or anything else. Okay. As long as they are willing to go down that hallway with me. All right. And you know, if you're not willing to go into a burning building, then I have a whole different set of um, things I would talk about. But you know, the thing is, you got to understand, this is what we do. And not everybody's meant to be a firefighter. No. And that's okay. And that's okay. But yeah. if you're not willing to go in there, listen, I tell people this to you all the time. I started in the volunteers when I was 18. And my family, I saw my grandmother's house catch fire when I was a kid. But when I started in the volunteers, the first time I went to a fire, and crawled down a hallway with a guy who was senior to me and took me down and showed me what we were doing. I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. And then when somebody said, oh yeah, you can study and you can get paid for this. I'm like, are you kidding me? And that's when I started prepping to become a New York City fireman. When I was this, I can get paid to do this. And I had so much fun doing it. And that's the great thing about the fire service. Listen. Being a firefighter, you have fun at work with the brothers and sisters. You enjoy each other's company. You play jokes on each other. You enjoy your time together. Now, fun should not hurt. I will make this clear. There should be nothing that is dangerous or in any way, shape, or form sexual or disparaging to anybody else. But playing a joke on guys and girls, I think it's hysterical. I mean, I remember sitting in the firehouse as the captain, sitting down in my favorite easy chair, and a minute later getting up and saying, son of a gun, these sons of you know what, my butt is soaking wet. They wet the cushions, and they thought they knew it was my favorite chair. I sat down, and I waited a minute till it all absorbed, and then I'm soaking wet. My butt is wet. I'm like, you got me. You sons of guns. You got me. Okay? Hysterical. Hysterical. Okay. I, I mean, it is funny. You got to laugh about it. And that stuff is, I don't have a problem with that. And you know, they got me, I got even, but that's okay. But you have to be enjoying what you are doing and have to be willing to do your job. I, I couldn't, I couldn't disagree with a word you said. And, and, uh, you know, we could get into a story about pranks, but I had some classics played on me and I, I, I love those the best when you were the butt of it, you know, it's like, Oh my God, you guys, you know, you just, you'd look at them like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill each one of you. But, but you, you were laughing so hard because they knew, you know, they knew exactly what to do to get to you. You know what I mean? Like the gags that were always played on me were like, okay, I get it. You know, there you go. I, you know, 
and it, and it was awesome. It was always awesome. So one of, one of the things I, I kind of want to do with the, the National Fireman's Journal podcast is kind of wrap things up with kind of like a question about burning issues, pet peeves, like what I want you to do for a second, Mike, is while I'm rambling here, think about like, what's your pet peeve today? Because I know tomorrow you and I will have a new one, but like what's stuck in your craw right now that you want to get out there uh, to just kind of like, okay, say, say you were coming to work and you're doing roll call and uh, you're, you're, the, you're the house captain or you're the, you know, the battalion chief or whatever. And uh, you know, you, you, you know, that, that always seemed to be the place for me where I would go, all right, just a second. You know, you, 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 and you'd throw something down and the troops would kind of listen. And then down the road, someone would say, okay, hey boss, what about if I did it this, I don't, okay. And, and, and we get that conversation going, right? Uh, it's it, it's kind of like the puzzle palace diffuser. You know, what's stuck in your craw right now? Something you want to throw out there while we wrap up uh, this inaugural edition of the National Fireman's Journal podcast? Well, I think there are a couple of things that are going on in the fire service right now. Um, I think one is representing yourself and your department properly. Uh, wearing anything with a Maltese cross, fire department hat or cap, or anything else, wearing it properly, going out there and looking respectful to the public. Even if you are off duty, if you are wearing your New York City Fire Department cap, if you are wearing your San Francisco Fire Department hat, your Houston, Texas, Boston, I don't care where, you are, everybody knows you're a member of the fire service, okay? Act accordingly. Okay, you can't be screaming at people in the street. You can't be everything else. Um, the guys in Chicago call it duty, pride, and tradition. I love that. Okay, uh, Rick Lasky calls it pride and ownership. Represent. Do the right thing. Okay, and I think that's a big one. I think the other thing is right now there's a huge push on um, whether we – um, make rescues or not with what's going on in the Atlanta area. And I think uh, one of the things about that is I personally don't have all the information. So I am not going to make a decision based on partial information. I have done that before in the past and been wrong and made a wrong decision because I did not have the complete set of facts. Until you know what exactly is going on, until you know all of the facts, I highly recommend that each of us take a step back and say, wait a second, am I 100% sure about this? Do I have all of the information I need to make an informed judgment? Good stuff. Really good stuff. Well, brother, it was awesome to have you on the show. Uh, some upcoming shows, uh, you know, we're going to be having Dan Majikowski, Stevie Kerber. Uh, we're going to be having a, a bunch of folks out of the New York City. Uh, Bill Gustin's going to be on. We're going to be talking with Dr. Pleshy and Dr. Um, Burgess about this whole PFOA thing. Everything and anything that's of interest to the fire service. We're going to be talking about volunteer issues, career issues, lifestyle issues. Um, this is the place where we just want to have conversations with my friends about the fire service. And, uh, and I hope you like it. I hope it uh, works for you. I hope you got to know a little bit about my good friend, Captain Mike Dugan. And, uh, you know, he's uh, going to be, again, the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award winner at FDIC this year. He, he teaches all across the country. If you want somebody to come in and talk to you about leadership or tactics or, you know, or, or you know, management, you name it, Mike can talk to you about it. Um, he's got a great handle on, on the American Fire Service and, and uh, never let you down. So, you know, just feel free to reach out to me or you know, Google us. We're, all, we're both all over the, the gigantic interweb thing. So uh, feel free to get a hold of us. So 
Thank you for watching the very first National Firemen's Journal podcast. Uh, we, we appreciate you being with us, and uh, we hope there was some valuable information for you. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. So I think, yep, I stopped the recording. I think. Okay, it still says recording on mine. Does it? Well, hang on then. <laughs>